Well, thanks everybody for coming uh, here today. We're here to talk about Metro government's first and greatest responsibility to every citizen in Louisville, and that, of course, is public safety. Uh, that's been our priority from the first day that I took office in January 2011, and lately this issue has come into even sharper focus because uh, well-known uh, sequence of tragedies involving the needless deaths of young black men and police officers in cities around the country. Since uh, Baton Rouge, uh, St. Paul, and Dallas, I have been even more deeply engaged in community conversations and visits and listening to many people in hearing their ideas for improving police and community relations. So I'm here today to report what we have been doing, what we are doing, and what we plan to do. We will always continue to listen to our citizens and respond to their needs. Now, it's no secret that we have law-abiding citizens and police officers who are worried about their own safety on all sides. And it's our job as a responsible group of city leaders to address those concerns and work with our citizens and our police officers to resolve them. In Louisville, our city, we reject any notion that this is an either-or scenario, that you have to pick one side or another. We support our communities of color and our LMPD officers. That is the only way forward. We want each and every one, all of our citizens, to reach their full potential. And to do that, they need to know that their humanity and their constitutional rights as Americans are respected. We want all of our police officers, each and every one, to come home safely to their families at the end of their shifts with the satisfaction of a job well done. So I'm here today to specifically announce three steps we're taking to achieve those goals. First, I'm proud to say that we have now outfitted every one of our LMPD patrol and traffic officers with a body camera. We've done that because studies show that it helps protect both citizens and police officers and reduces citizen complaints about the use of excessive force. And our own experience backs that up. We've seen a reduction in citizen complaints since we began the rollout last year. Lieutenant Colonel Robert Schroeder will talk about body cameras in more detail in a moment. And of course, you can check out all of our LMPD crime and policing data online at data.louisvilleky.gov because we believe in transparency and metro government. You all will also know that we are among the first cities nationwide to put our crime data online, and we were recognized by the White House for doing so. In fact, Chief Conrad cannot be here today because he's at the White House for a 21st century policing workshop. Second, we're establishing a citizens advisory board that will review and make recommendations to LMPD on how to refine the training we provide officers and recruits so they have the knowledge and skills they need to reduce crime while maintaining strong connections with the community. We need to continually improve training protocol for both recruits and police officers. In my community conversations post the uh, Baton Rouge and Dallas shootings, one of the concerns that I hear repeatedly is the first interaction between the officer and the citizen how that sets the tone for the rest of the interaction, and I believe that is an opportunity for us to better train on that initial touch. And when I've talked to our professionals at our Recruit Training Academy, they express that same type of desire for anything that they can learn to improve police community relations. Deputy Chief Mike Sullivan will speak about this in more detail in a moment. Third, following the lead of LMPD, I'm directing our HR department to train every Metro employee from the mayor's office to public works to recognize and eliminate implicit or unconscious bias in themselves and others so everyone is treated with dignity and respect. Implicit bias recognizes that we are all unique and have different experiences. We're all human and sometimes subtle forms of prejudice and stereotyping can manifest itself in our behavior and interactions and we're not even aware of it. So sometimes 
we may treat a woman differently than a man uh, or an African-American or Latino neighbor from a Caucasian or a colleague differently than someone who is of a different skin color. LMPD has already been going through this training for quite some time. Uh, we started with our police force because of the tremendously challenging and dangerous and unpredictable nature of their jobs. Think about what we ask our police officers to do, and we've heard this a lot over the last couple weeks. We ask our officers to be mental health counselors, substance abuse experts, health experts, and social workers in addition to fighting crime. And when an LMPD officer responds to a call at a home or pulls over a speeding car, he or she has no way of knowing if the person they're about to talk to will respond with courtesy or hostility, if they'll pull out their ID or they'll pull out a gun. So that's part of the nature of police work. And one of the reasons that the men and women who wear the uniform deserve our respect and gratitude citywide. Now, unfortunately, we know there are law-abiding citizens in our community, in our country, who fear for their lives when they interact with police officers. And that's one of the things we have to change. The steps I've outlined are part of our efforts to continue to build even more trust and deepen and strengthen the relationships between our police officers and our communities of color. Though I am happy to report there is a lot of goodwill already in place for us to build on. That was very clear to me during these past couple of weeks as I paid visits uh, throughout the city in even more intensity. I paid visits during roll call to each of our eight patrol divisions around Louisville following the shootings of police in Dallas. I saw that citizens in all of our neighborhoods around our police substations have shown tremendous support and appreciation for our LMPD officers. You could see it as you walked into the main conference room. There'd be flowers, cakes, cards, kids with written cards and posters saying thank you. That was very reassuring to me and certainly to our police officers as well. LMPD knows, and I know, that we will always need to strengthen police community relations. That should not be an embarrassment to us, to a city. When we see an area where we can improve, we want to identify it, we want to jump right into it. When you neglect areas like this, this is when problems occur. And there's broad recognition in all of our neighborhoods that police, this was told to me time and time again, have a difficult but extraordinarily essential job to do in each and every one of our neighborhoods. You all might be familiar with our culture of continuous improvement here in Metro government. And so we celebrate when we find areas to improve because we want to eliminate them. And what that means is we're going to have higher customer citizen satisfaction. And that's true whether it's my office, or it's true whether it's LMPD. I'm just grateful we have that culture here in our city and with your Metro government. So we're building on the goodwill that we have in the community already by expanding our community policing efforts through a $1.5 million federal COPS grant we received last year, and it's in our current year budget. We're adding 10 officers to the community policing effort, freeing them from responding to 911 calls so they can better get to know young people and other citizens in all of our neighborhoods, and especially those neighborhoods with higher crime rates. We're holding more community conversations like coffee with the cop, youth chats, and much more. In fact, we have an LMPD youth chat coming up tonight at the Beachmont Community Center. We're expanding the number of peace walks that we're doing, where Chief Conrad and I and other members of the command staff take a walk through some of our higher crime neighborhoods. Deputy Chief Sullivan will talk a bit more about these in a moment. We will have peace walks every week in every division. Our last peace walk was two days ago. We had conversations with citizens in their yards, sidewalks, on their front porches, just checking in about what's happening in our neighborhoods and what they need and what can be improved. We have no agenda on these peace walks other to be present, to show support, and to listen. We've also been meeting with citizens and activists from Black Lives Matters and other organizations right here in Metro Hall listening to their concerns and hearing their stories, their experiences. We're doing that, obviously, so we can better understand what's happening and what has happened and what needs to happen in the future. 
and our efforts to improve public safety extend way beyond policing. We have a strong, strong history of interfaith relationships and leadership in Louisville, and we're working with our faith community to better help connect with citizens. And our Office for Safe and Healthy Neighborhoods is working with both LMPD and many of our communities of color. Since we created the Office for Safe and Healthy Neighborhoods in 2013, we've secured more than $10 million in grants to support programs like Right Turn and Pivot to Peace. So these are really promising efforts that are helping young people find and stay on the path to a better future. Rashad Abdul Rahman is going to talk more about that in a moment, and we'll take questions if need be. Now remember, we're always looking for mentors. People are asking me all the time, how can I help? You can help by signing up as a mentor and devote a little bit of your time to helping young people stay on the right path. So these are just some of the steps we're taking to improve public safety. Uh, we're listening to our citizens and our police officers and taking action to support everyone who calls this city home. So if anybody is determined to pick a side in this ongoing conversation about our community, understand that in Louisville we pick the side of peace, of compassion, and community. We pick the side where citizens and their government, including their police force, work together for everybody's benefit. And I invite every citizen and police officer to join us on this journey. So now to hear a little bit more of some of the, about some of the policing initiatives, uh, Deputy Chief Mike Sullivan will speak to us. Chief. You know, I want to start out today by thanking the men and women of the police department. Uh, despite the recent incidents that uh, have occurred and, and the environment that uh, is out there right now, and acknowledging that our officers feel vulnerable out there right now, uh, they continue to be the guardians of the community that we expect them to be. Uh, and my sincere, sincere thanks to the community. The mayor spoke to it just a minute ago. Uh, the outpouring that we see at the divisions uh, from uh, flowers and uh, cookies and, and different uh, thank you cards being delivered to our uh, police divisions to just being stopped on the street or in a restaurant, which seems to happen more often in the last several weeks, and just saying thank you. Uh, I also want to talk about uh, the part of the community that is out there sharing their concerns with us, because we're not going to be able to build that legitimacy that we really need to build unless we have those tough conversations. So we're absolutely blessed in Louisville to li live in a compassionate, compassionate community that's willing to go out and uh, tackle these tough 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 issues. Uh, I want to talk real briefly about the 21st century policing and, and some of the initi initiatives that are out there. We've been recognized already uh, and been to the White House several times uh, talking about 21st century policing and being looked at it as a model of how we're implementing that, that, uh, that reform. Actually under Pillar 5, which is training the education in that report, uh, it talks about building levels of trust and legit legitimacy through training and education. And one of those recommendations is that we, uh, that law enforcement should engage the community in training. And one of the ways that we look to do this is to set up a training advisory board, taking citizens from our community and bringing them into our training unit and have them look at our training curriculum, give us input, feedback, and, and be able to share and educate them with what the training we're already doing. Uh, we think this will be very positive and we expect this to actually uh, ramp up before the end of this year. Something else we're committed to doing is ho holding community forums to talk about all the work we've done in 21st century policing already. Uh, we plan to do that by uh, mid to late August and we should have details on that. Uh, but we expect there to be several forums around the city where we can talk about that and get input uh, on the work that we've done and, and work that we can do going forward. One thing that I, I want to put out there is if you want to be part of the change, LMPD is always hiring. We're taking applications right now. And, and if you want to change uh, from the inside, please come join us. We need, we need the uh, officers out there. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Rob uh, Schroeder. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Schroeder is going to speak to our efforts in the wearable video system that we've went over in the past year. And uh, we can take some questions after, after everybody gets a chance to talk. 
Good morning. In uh, June of last year, we implemented the first pilot body camera program in LMPD's 5th Division. Uh, since then, we rolled it out to all of our patrol divisions and to our traffic unit. Uh, and that includes our 9th Mobile Division. When we were looking for people to put it with, we were basically looking for the people who had the most interaction with the public, who would have the most daily contacts with the public, and those were the units really that we identified that would be um, more likely to do so. So since that, pro since that initial rollout, we've done a phased rollout to all the divisions. We are complete with all of our patrol officers and our traffic officers. Uh, we have left our K-9 unit and our SWAT team are the two units that we have left to deploy to, and there's some technological reasons. Uh, we have to do some upgrades before we can do those. However, we've been working with two universities doing studies of our body camera project since then, and because of the phase rollout, we don't have a solid, uh, solid full year picture, but in the preliminary um, view of what's happened since, since we started this program, we've actually seen a 13% increase in calls for service from the public for our officers, while at the same time, we're seeing a 21% reduction in the officers who've been assaulted, a 7% decrease in citizen complaints against officers, and a 35% reduction in the uses of forces, force our officers have uh, been forced to do. Uh, so those are good numbers. Uh, hopefully, once we get a better picture after all the divisions have had a full year, we'll be able to give you a more solid full year picture. Um, they have also been instrumental in investigations involving our public integrity unit. We had a shooting last year at Club Crush where a body camera was actually used and it was helpful to our public integrity investigators to see what actually happened within that shooting. So it has been a good program to us. It is really a tool in our toolbox to help with our transparency with the community. As uh, Assistant Chief, or Deputy Chief Sullivan and the Mayor both spoke about, transparency is one of the largest components of LMPD. We want to be as transparent and open with the public, show, them that, show the public that we are not afraid to let you see what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, and body cameras are a tool both to protect the public and to protect our officers, uh, which in this current climate around the nation is very important. And we have a brief video to show you. This is one of our 8th Division officers uh, encountering a citizen during a traffic stop. And I believe this was uh, just a stop sign violation. Hello, Officer Wonka Metro Police. I stopped you because you didn't come close to stopping at the stop sign there oh. at Bayberry and Hermitage Way there. Can I see your driver's license and insurance? Is this your car, ma'am? Yes, it is. All right. Okay. All right. You still live on Cottonwood? I do, yes. All right. Give me a couple seconds. I'll get you on your way. Okay. I don't need to worry about any guns, knives, ever oh, had no, zoops, no, no. cans, and narcotics or something the lad's head rolling around? No, no, no. Then we're good to go. All right. All right give me a couple seconds. Okay. 832 Charlie. When you get a chance, traffic stops. I'll be in plantation till 1530 hours. Hermitage Way, Westport Road, on Kentucky, 615, Adam, Mike, John.
ongoing issue. Apparently, it was another round of This. this is a courtesy notice. The mayor's real big on stop signs. Okay. So she wants me to stop everybody that runs and gives them a ticket. This is a courtesy notice. You don't have to do anything with it. Okay. Except keep in mind that if I stop you again, right. I'll probably issue a citation. Sound fair enough? Yes, it does. All Thank right. So Drive much. safely, please. Thank you. All right. You too. And the officer in this particular instance was there at the request of the mayor of one of our smaller cities over some stop sign um, instances they've had. So overall, the program has been a success, and uh, we have Officer Collins here. If, uh, if you need to remind yourself of what the cameras look like, uh, we'll be glad to take any questions after the conference. Thanks. Okay, thanks very much. Now, Rashad Abdurrahman is going to talk to us about some of our initiatives with the Office for Safe and Healthy Neighborhoods. So we obviously look at this as kind of the uh, police department is one aspect of it, the community policing aspect of it, and then some of the more proactive things we do as well, kind of cross-jurisdictionally cross from the Office for Safe and Healthy Neighborhoods. Rashad? Thank you very much, Mayor. Appreciate it. Um, as the Mayor stated, the Office for Safe and Healthy Neighborhoods was created for our city to have a more comprehensive approach to violence reduction. We know that we simply cannot arrest our way to a more prosperous society. We've, we've tried that, it hasn't worked, it didn't work. As a society, it is important that we continue to lean into these complex issues. And I think that's something that we're really uh, intentional and dedicated to doing here in Louisville. We don't stick our heads in the sand. We don't hope that they will simply go away. We know that it is critical to have balanced conversations around historical and structural contexts that have led us to our current reality. Our participation in the Racial Equity Here cohort, for example, will only bolster our ability to do this with intention. The pursuit of a safe city demands us to fearlessly confront racial, economic, and social inequity. That's why Mayor Fisher accepted President Obama's My Brother's Keeper Challenge in 2014. 
We know that we are losing young black men and boys at an unacceptable rate to homicide and gun violence. So it is essential that we are investing in efforts to support them, to let them know that we care and that we love them. Safe and healthy neighborhoods are places where youth are not discarded because they made a mistake. Too many of our citizens between 16 and 24 with prior justice involvement are limited in their opportunities. We partnered with Kentuckiana Works to launch Right Turn and Reimage so that these individuals could have the support of a case manager and a mentor to get back on the right path. At some point in our lives, all of our lives, we all needed that one caring adult who could help guide us, who could help shape us, and lend us a hand up. No one is asking for a hand out. And what about our youth who feel caught, up, caught in a cycle of bad choices, violence, and hopelessness? The Office for Safe and Healthy Neighborhoods partnered with Peace Ed, University Hospital, and Kentucky One Health to launch Pivot to Peace an evidence-based hospital intervention program that works with individuals being treated in the hospital for a gunshot wound or stabbing. This is a critical intervention point where there is an increased likelihood to reach someone with the right kind of supports and help them pivot from a course of retaliation. We are proud that the mayor has continued to invest in a comprehensive public safety strategy Due to this investment, over the next few months, we will be moving forward with hiring a community response liaison who will work to identify resources for neighborhoods highly affected by the trauma of violence. And we can't let that trauma conversation sort of dissipate as we talk about violence. The reality is that so many of our youth, so many of our families are being affected on a traumatic level um, with some of the experiences that are happening in our neighborhoods. We will also be leveraging federal resources to increase community level efforts by recruiting fellows to help launch innovative ideas like the One Love Louisville Neighborhood Ambassador Program. The idea is to recruit citizens to be trained in mental health first aid, community organizing, suicide prevention, and more. We have already been working with members of council to support this initiative. As always, visit us at onelovelou.org for more information. Lastly, I would like to invite folks out to the Brown Foreman Amphitheater at Waterfront Park today. We're doing a field day in partnership that's being hosted by the Office for Safe and Healthy Neighborhoods, Hope by Hope, and Zones of Hope. So a lot of hope there, right? Um, it is from 2 p.m. to 7 p.m. There's going to be lots of games for the whole family. And I hear that there's going to be a water balloon situation as well. It's the last few weeks before school starts, so let's keep the kids occupied and hopefully help them to enjoy what's left of the summer. There is little doubt, very little doubt, that we have much work to do, very little doubt. But we also know that this work belongs to all of us. What are we doing to pay our rent here on Earth? We desperately need mentors. We desperately need businesses that are going to give a young person a first and fair chance. We talk a lot about second chances, but we need to elevate the need for that first and fair chance. And we do need those second chances as well. Um, for a young person who's made a mistake but is returning to their community and, and is looking for a way to support and provide for themselves. The things that each of us do, big and small, matter. We are interconnected partners in producing a safer and healthier city. Thanks. Thank you, Rashad. So I'm, I'm glad to say, too, that some of the things that you're hearing about here today, uh, whether it be the Citizens Advisory Board on our training or the hiring of the community liaison uh, with One Love Louisville. These actions were in place already, but we wanted to go ahead and highlight some of them here today. So in closing, I, I want to thank uh, again profusely LMPD for the tough job that they do every day. I want to thank our citizens uh, as well. A lot of the things that you're hearing today, I, I, want, I thought it was important for us to kind of give a report out uh, to our citizens on our reflections and actions since the last two weeks. I want to thank all of our citizens and LMPD officers that have been uh, honest, straightforward, uh, participating in this dialogue on how we move our cities forward in America during this difficult time the country is experiencing. So for each and every one of these folks that step up and have an idea or describe an experience, they are essential parts of moving our city forward. So I want to say thank you to them as well. And then for the ongoing, ongoing forum, I just want to emphasize that you all caught this as well. The LMPD forums on 21st century policing 
will be just another ongoing way for people to participate in this conversation that we're going to always be having in our city on how we can improve our police community relations. So there'll be just another dialogue as well, but I wanted to do a little report out here today. So what we're talking about is how now how we implement all these things, how we continue to work together. Uh, we all are human, obviously, and we need to recognize each other's common humanity. The more we do that, the better we can move forward together. So I'd like to end here on a lighter note and with an example of our abundant humanity on display. Uh, this video that you're about ready to see comes from Cleveland. Uh, we have 30 LMPD officers assisting the Cleveland police during the Republican National Convention. And during a down moment, they recorded this and it's gone viral, viral all over the country. So we'd like to thank Officer Dustin Dean who's for putting a very human face on the city of Louisville. I can't say that's part of our plan to incorporate breakdancing into our community outreach efforts, but who knows? So anyway, good job to Officer Dean there. Okay, we're happy to take any questions. Can you talk to us about this uh, citizen advisory board? Do you know who's going to make it up and, uh, and when it will actually start? Mike. Right. We've been working on this for about the last six months. Uh, we expect the board to be made up of a diverse uh, group of community members, uh, from clergy to people involved in training businesses uh, to people from educational institutions. To, to critics of the police who have concerns about, uh, you know, what our training actually is. Uh, we, we plan to have it in place by the end of the year. How will it differ than the Citizens Commission on Police Accountability? This is an advisory board, not unlike the advisory boards in every police division uh, that each division major relies on. It'll be run with uh, the leadership of the training division commander. And uh, along with the input that they will give us, uh, on training issues. They'll also give us input on recruiting issues too. We run our uh, recruiting unit out of our training unit. So we expect uh, to have that community input uh, throughout our training and recruiting. How will you decide who makes up this board? Uh, we'll reach out to people that have been engaged bef before, but we'll, we'll put uh, applications out and, and, and go through the process. Uh, we're, we're still working through the, the exact details of how we're, we're going to do that. And I'm hoping that uh, especially some of our young men of color are part of this advisory board. Uh, I mean, obviously, that's a clear part of the national dialogue in our my, many of my community listening sessions. That's where some of the uh, most intense concerns were about some of that first interaction that police officers have with the citizen. So we're hoping that they will step forward and offer their insight uh, as well and see uh, both sides of the equation here. And then we want to emphasize, too, this, this board is for recruits, so first folks that are coming in, but it's also for our in-service training, so the annual 40-hour requirement that our police have for training as well, so we can just make sure that we're keeping up to speed uh, with all the latest community concerns. You mentioned that citizen complaints are down. Before body cameras came to be, they were also trending down. Uh, so can, I mean, can, we, can we attribute body cameras to declining citizen complaints? Because we see chief initiated complaints are also relatively stable. Well, I mean, one of the reasons, obviously, we uh, believe so strongly in the body camera uh, approach is that it makes everything real transparent. One of the things that went into our decision is just uh, what you said, Jake, that uh, national data indicated in other cities both citizens' complaints, citizen complaints, and police use of force decreased. So we're seeing those same uh, results here preliminarily as uh, Rob reported here. So uh, we hope that trend will continue. When we hear some of these things you know, about interaction, it takes on a very different life than when we can pull up that tape and see what actually happened. You mentioned uh, there's technological reasons that are keeping the SWAT team from getting body cameras. Is there any resistance from the SWAT team in getting body cameras? Can you talk about how that might play out in the future? 
Yeah, I wouldn't say there's any resistance. Um, in discussions with the SWAT commanders, obviously we have to get it to where we're transparent with the public on what the SWAT team is doing while at the same time protecting the tactics the SWAT team uses uh, to protect the citizens. So it's really finding that balance. Um, and, and the issues revolve around uh, basically the SWAT team recently relocated to, to a new location. And the K-9 unit that I mentioned previously also has some just issues with technology. Getting the necessary bandwidth to utilize the cameras to the locations they're at is, is really what the concern is. So. Okay. Um, can we ask about how many, what trends are you seeing as far as recruits? Are you guys having more people sign up, less people sign up, and what kind of um, diversity are we seeing? Yeah, generally, over the last uh, years, we, we, couple of years, we, we've seen a decrease in the number of applications that we've received. Uh, to that, we started a uh, two-year pilot program where we've removed the 60-hour college entrance requirement, and that actually uh, should be up today uh, as these new, new hiring requirements. Uh, that being said, we've hired more in the last several years than we have the entire time of the Metro Police Department. We've hired close to 100 officers uh, each of the last two years, which, which are, are huge numbers, and, and we're uh, planning on hiring up to 122 this year. Uh, so there's challenges that are absolutely that are out there, uh, but we seem to be meeting those challenges and uh, doing what we need to do to, to make sure that we have an adequate pool to, to get the right number of uh, people in the door that want to come out and serve the community. Okay, well, I just want to say last thing. I want to give a shout out to the families of our police officers. Uh, 36 hours after the Dallas shooting, I visited the, uh, our recruit academy and talked to the families of the recruits. Uh, they just happened to have that scheduled already so they could learn how to be the family member of a police officer. And you could imagine the kind of trepidation that people were feeling just after five police officers were gunned down in Dallas. And so there was a lot of con concern with the family members. Uh, the recruits, uh, on the other hand, sure, they were concerned. But they were standing tall and proud because they realized that now more than ever, we need good, courageous, compassionate police officers in our community. And I'm just thankful that there are a lot of people that are still making that call. So thanks, everybody, for coming out today.